Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to another episode of Canadian Investing in the U.S. This week, my guest is Ken Gee. Uh, Ken, let's uh, start by giving everybody a bit of an intro to yourself, uh, what you do, how you got there, and then we'll, we'll jump into this. Sure, sure. So I'm the, the founder and managing member of uh, KRI Partners. It's, it's actually a vertically integrated real estate investment firm. So I started it back in 1997. Uh, we, the company originally grew up in Cleveland. About 15 years ago, we decided it's hard to make money in Cleveland. Let's uh, see how we can do in uh, some of the Sun Belt states. So we went down to Florida and uh, opened up our doors there. Uh, you know, fast forward to currently, we, we've done a number of syndications. We raise, uh, now we raise money through a blind pool fund and we invest 100% in multifamily. And uh, we, we manage a couple thousand units throughout central and northern Florida. Over the years, we've done about 15, 16,000 units. So we've, uh, we've been around a really long time. And, uh, you know, basically what we do is, uh, you know, my goal in life is to help people change their life through real estate investment, right? I mean, it's incredibly lucrative and, or can be. And so, we, you know, we help our investors, uh, you know, do the things that they're trying to do in terms of uh, reach their financial goals, save for retirement, put their kids through school, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what we do. That's a lot of big stuff. <laughs> uh, is there, like, I don't know if I want to really want to go down this path, but like on the transition, like did you start right into that stuff or was there a, is there building steps to get to doing that much of those big, big deals? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So my first deal was 28 units. So I was at the time, I, I'm also a CPA by background. Yep. And I spent five years as a commercial lender, kind of lends itself well to this business. But what happened in 1997, I was working at Deloitte and I, I was just killing myself, right? CPAs work really hard. And so I wanted to get into the real estate business because all of our clients were making tons of money. When I was a lender, they were making tons of money. I thought, I, I, need, to, I need to get in this game. Yep. So I looked at singles, doubles, larger properties. And what I knew was when you're working 80 hours a week, you really don't have a lot of extra, and you have a family, you don't have a lot of extra time to go fix leaky no. pipes and things like that. So I had to buy a property that was big enough that allowed me to find someone to part-time help out on site to show the units and coordinate maintenance and stuff like that. So that's what's led me to my first 28 unit of property. Then as I grew over time, we just slowly grew larger, probably in the mid 2000s is when we started to syndicate. So for a long time, I did it with my own money yep. because I wanted to learn on my own dime, not someone else's. Sorry. Then from the mid 2000s, we started to raise money for in individual deals. And so now we do it, um, you know, now the challenge in a state like Florida or, or in the, some of the competitive states is everybody's syndicating, right? So they'll go find a deal and then they go try to raise the money. And if you do that, you know, it's a really stressful thing. Plus it's super competitive because everybody else is syndicating. So what we did a few years ago was we said, all right, wait a minute, we have to be competitive in this environment. Let's go raise the money first, then go find the deal. Makes us an incredibly strong buyer because now sellers know there's no equity raise risk anymore. So that's kind of how we progressed it. You know, we kind of did it incrementally in a way that I felt like it made sense, gave me time to build a foundation underneath. You know, we've got 50 or so employees. So it gave me time to build that foundation so that as we grew, and scaled our business, you know, we, we're, we're able to be successful and it doesn't sort of implode on itself. Smart. And I love one part I love is that you, you started with your own money <laughs> and um, that's even myself, even how I switch markets, I start with my own money, mm -hmm. <laughs> proof of concept, then bring people in um, the people who just, I'm going to do my first deal and raise it. It's kind of scary. I'm like the people who, you know, if you are doing this, vet your people a little bit. hundred <laughs> percent. I'm with you, man. I'm with you there. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, you're doing all these multifamilies and actually one of the reasons I got on the show was to, uh, to talk about doing the renovations, these multifamilies and some steps sure. to go through. Right. So yep. maybe, maybe let's touch on that and then I'll cut you off throughout to, to ask some questions. Yeah, no, no worries. Ask any, any, any question you like. So, the, basically, there's five things that I would probably talk about here. Okay. Now, oddly enough, the first three have nothing to do with renovating. That's going to surprise you, but I think they're super important. So let's talk about the first thing you got to do is you got to really do an in-depth market study, right? The reason you have to do that is you have to really understand where your property sends, uh, sits in the current rental pool 
and where you want it to be once you're done. And what's important about renovating is if you don't fully understand how much upside there is in rents, you yep. cannot make any good economic decision because you, you don't know where you're going, right? So you got to start there. And it takes, you know, you got to go online, you got to go to everybody's website, you got to figure out what are they charging. And then, so you're looking at your little comp set, the way your property is now, but yep. then you're going to look one level above it because you're hopefully going to take your property from where it is, and you're going to make it better. And that's going to make you compete in a new market, a new little competitive set, and you want to do that. So that's step one. That's probably not what anybody and, thought and about. This is like you're doing, uh, like you're doing the analysis. Or are you talking about a market analysis as well? Are you talking about what's going on in that city as well? Yeah, but specifically here, I'm talking. I mean, all of it kind of gets baked into what you can charge for rent. Right. So, right. what is the seller charging now? What do you think you can get without doing anything? And then, what is it going to look like when you're done? Because in the end, when you're done, you're going to have a certain rent structure, you're going to have a certain expense structure, and you're going to know what the value should probably be. That allows you to just budget everything, right? Because mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is budget too much in terms of improvements and then realize when you go to sell, uh oh, I spent too much money. That would be a bad situation. Agreed? Oh, definitely. <laughs> so <laughs> that's step one. Secondly, um, figure out your budget and constantly reevaluate that budget. So when we do a renovation and we do these almost on every project we do, you know, we do one when I initially look at it, then we do another one at LOI. Then we typically do another one when we're in the best and final round. Then we do, and all we're doing is revising the prior budget because we're learning more. Then we go through due diligence. We do it again. And, and now that we know, you know, what's really going on now, Here's the third thing that I want people to do. And again, this is not what most people want to do, but when you close, the property is now yours. You've gone through due diligence. You think you know that property, but you don't. Trust me, you don't. Wait 30, 60, 90 days, wait some period. I don't care what the period is. I want you to wait for a few minutes to run the property because the skeletons will show up. The things the seller didn't tell you Maybe the things the seller didn't even know, but here's what's important about that. So when you learn the things that you didn't know before, you're gonna be able to reallocate your capital improvement budget because you haven't spent it yet, right? So you, you're gonna need that last sort of whack and we keep, we keep evaluating all the way through the process, but that's a really important opportunity for you to really make sure that you're spending money on the right things. Now I know this because a long time ago, I made that mistake. I went in full speed, spent all my rental money and then found something that, uh oh, I really wish I would have known that because now I have no money to fix it. And if you know, you don't go back to your partners for money. So you, you figure out how to pay for it yourself is what ends up happening. So that's the third step. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And that's a tough one too, because Honestly, you, you want to get in there and you want to get these things. You want to raise your rents. You want to push this, move up your NOI so that you can refinance. Like in with multifamily, it's, these aren't overnight, six, even six month projects. Usually you're, right. there's a lot of units to, to turn, right? So you want to get started. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're exactly right. So it, there are probably some things that you just know you got to do, right? If the right. roofs are leaking like this, I mean, <laughs> you got to do them. You're not going to probably change that, but you just want to be careful. And again, 90 days, you could easily argue is a long time. Maybe it's 30, whatever it is, do you get comfortable that you understand where the skeletons are? That's the critical. Uh, no, I, I like it. It's, it's That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. So now the next thing I want people to do when they renovate a property is use an outside in approach. It kind of seems obvious that you would do that, but you would be surprised at how many times I've seen people doing an inside out renovation. So what I mean is when we plan our renovations, I literally walk all the way out to the street and I walk carefully as if I'm a, a renter or prospective uh, resident and I look at everything they see and I start to address each and everything as they see it, as they're going through the property, right? right. It's that people laugh at me because I talk about the Jerry Maguire movie, yeah. you had me at hello. I want to get them at hello every step of the way. So I need to renovate from the outside in. So we typically, 
attack the common areas, make sure the leasing and the whole clubhouse amenity package is, is really cool because that's where you can grab people emotionally. And then, so this is why it's key in multifamily. You do, when you go to the units, you just don't want to screw it up, right? You want to maintain the same level. You just don't want them to be let down. See, if you do an inside out renovation, all that money you spent, those wonderful granite countertops and stainless steel appliances and beautiful hardwood floors and beautiful light fixtures, they're all hidden behind a locked door. And if you can't get people to, behind, to that door, your renovation money is wasted. I know it seems obvious, but I'm telling you, I see people do it all the time. And it makes me really sad because they can't hit their rents because they can't get the good people to even stop. Yep. yep. And the most obvious sign that that's happening is when you have people get no-shows. The leasing people, compl they complain. You know, I keep having a lot of no-shows. Well, they showed up. They just kept going because they didn't like what they saw. And they you didn't even get a chance to show them the inside of that unit. So yeah. that's probably step four. And you know, to cut you off here again, sure. the, I, it's not the same, but I went to a restaurant last week and it was beautifully renovated inside, but there was no one there. And the outside was like old brick and it was all chipped off. And the inside was impeccable, but no one had went in because they just look, they drive right by and find something else that looked nicer on the outside. And it's, and it, I was the whole time I, when I was in there, cause I, you know, always think in real estate and I'm like, yeah. why didn't they do something to the outside, even paint it, like do something. It looks like a piece of junk on the outside, but it's amazing on the inside. And if they would have done, if they would have done something or even worked the other way, you would have got them in at least. And then maybe they went like, Oh, I don't know. This the inside is a little <laughs> sketchy, but <laughs> at least you, you got, got them yeah, in yeah. to have the conversation. Or... When I started investing in the U.S., I did it by myself and had to go through the growing pains of doing that. GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. A 12-week coaching program done one hour per week over Zoom from the comfort of your own home. Classes are kept to five people to be able to answer everyone's questions. Shortcut the process. Make fewer mistakes. Curriculum available at GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. I think what happens to people is they spend, business owners spend their time inside their businesses. Yeah. Apartment owners spend time what they think, they think, wait a minute, resident lives in the unit. That's what they care about. They care about in the unit. And I don't disagree. They do care about in the unit. But what they can't do is, is let's say you got somebody to travel through the crappy looking common areas and the horrible amenities. When they, you know, they're inside their unit, they feel really good. Yep. But then they tell their mom, their dad, their friends, their family, they don't want to be embarrassed when those people drive up to go visit them. I mean, that's what it's really about. So it, it seems sort of obvious, but I'm telling you, it happens all the time. And it's just because of that mindset. People think people live inside the units. That's where you should spend your money. And, and they're right. They do live inside the units. You just don't need, you need to make sure you spend the money on the outside first. The other thing from a renovation budget standpoint, every dollar we put into something on the common areas, we love building up our amenity package. We love doing outdoor kitchens, outdoor TVs, nice wicker furniture. We love creating a story because most people can't afford to put all that stuff in their home, even if they lived in a single family home, right? Right. We can have all of that for them. But here's the key. We only spend that money one time. If you're doing unit renovations, you're spending it again and again and again and again, and it just never quits, right? Right. If you got a couple hundred units, do 10 grand times a hundred, couple hundred units, that's a massive, massive number. And it's much harder to make a difference in, in, the, in the investment world. Does that make sense? That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it does draw them in. It does because you a lot of it is uh, about your friends and you, your, you have a friend over and you go see this wicked party patio on the top or on the back and... You know, it's the people like, oh, this is a cool place, right? And that's, that's what exactly want. what they say. As <laughs> yeah. soon as you get them emotionally connected, and we even teach our leasing people to tell them a story. So we like our amenity packages. So imagine kids are in the pool, the outdoor girl, dad's cooking lunch, yeah. outdoor TV. He can still watch the Florida State game, whatever game you want to watch. They're still watching the Jaguars. They're still watching the Buccaneers, yeah. right? And mom's in the fitness center working out 
and then they can all trade and they're all having this whole family thing that really matters to families, right? They care about that stuff. Exactly. And we try to tell that story because then people can understand, wow, you're right. I, I, I couldn't put this in my single family home. It would cost me a bundle of money. Yep. So oh. the last thing I would say, and I think I already kind of touched on this, and that is just constantly reassessing your plan. One thing that I see people do, especially when they're not that experienced and they raise money, is they're a little bit, they, they don't have quite the confidence that, that they should when they're out raising money. So what they do is they present a renovation plan to their investors on day one or whenever they started to court their investors. Right. And they feel like if they change that plan, it will make them look to the investors as if they don't know what they're doing. And I see people get mired in that. It's almost like stepping into wet concrete, right? You can't get out of it. You feel like you shouldn't move, right? But I'm here to tell you that that is actually the worst thing you can do because you're going to learn so much from the day you start courting investors. Even as we're going through the project, I'm constantly asking myself, do we need to put gutters on this building? Do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? Because sometimes your initial reaction isn't really the right one, right? You just see a problem, you think to solve it, but if you're only holding a property three years and the property has been on there for 35 years yeah, and it's existed without gutters, do you really need gutters? Is that really going to add value? So you really start to challenge that. And I want people to, to just tell their investors up front, guys, this is a dynamic plan. It will change. And, and just know that that's the right thing to do. But it, that comes with confidence. But I would say, make sure you do that through the process because it's super important. At least I think it is. Because then you're reallocating and using your investor's capital the best way you can, right? When you learn something, you divert the, the resources to the right thing rather than doing the wrong thing just because you told the guy six months, nine months ago you were going to do it. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. Yeah. And what would, like, you're, you're talking about some of the things that might be the not the right place to spend your money what will you get the most bang for your buck? Like what are the kind of things that people, you know, you, you get the best return on? Yeah. So in the multifamily world, I care the most about how our entrances. So I like to spend money on land, a lot of money on landscaping near our entrance yep. and near our amenity package. Those are the two places that I think grab the most attention. And you're going to hear landscaping throughout my, my, my answer here, because that is so important. If you've got nice, neat and clean, nicely mulched, irrigated property with nice green grass and nice brown mulch, I mean, you, you've got a neat and clean, really nice looking property. So that landscaping is probably the number one thing that I'm talking about common areas now. Then we go to the amenity package. And I just like, I, I love adding amenities. I think I've talked about that enough, but that's number two probably. And number three, it depends on where the property is. If you're up north, there's more brick and stone, so you really can't do this. But the further south you go, paint actually has a bigger impact on the character and feel of the property uh, than you know. I mean, initially, in uh, you know, I, the company grew up in Cleveland. Right. Most everything is brick. Well, you're not painting that brick. Not a chance, right? That would be silly. But down south, I can completely change the character of a property with paint. It, it's truly amazing. So that's probably the top three things that I would like people to focus on. Then in the units, you want to go with kitchens um, and flooring and fixtures, right? Baths, yes, they're important. I just, the number one thing I see people do wrong when they're renovating is they over-improve. I mean, we do some third-party management and I constantly challenge our clients. I say, time out. They're projecting $200 rent increases. I said, I, I, let, me, let me do something. Let me see if I can get there with just a normal turn without doing any renovations. And in this crazy market we've been in, we get them all day long. So now they can decide how to more wisely spend their money. You know, you don't need granite necessarily. You, you know, a nice faux granite countertop, neat and clean will do the job, right? We like kitchen faucets that pull out and spray and that's cool, right? It's 150 bucks, really well spent, right? Yes. Nice, clean, light fixtures. Those and, and the flooring, right? The flooring is critical. Um, we're getting, you know, we do very little carpet now unless we absolutely have to. Yeah. So those are some those are some of the some of the ways that we renovate. Hopefully that's helpful. No, it is that is really helpful. I think it is it, it makes 
and I even say the same thing, even with my my smaller buildings, is to not to over renovate. And a lot of times, uh, you look at the comps, you look at what, and you talked about even talking about going to the next level, but you 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 look at what you want to be, where you are, and what you need to be. And uh, if I'm even doing, a, say, a flip in a certain neighborhood, you don't put granite in. You might be laminate countertops because they ain't going to pay any different. You put it in there. It's the That's exact right. same thing, right? So you, uh, but if the neighborhood dictates it, you put it in, right? Um, so you don't want to be behind because otherwise you're going to. There gonna is, there is one other thing that I'll mention. I, I forgot to mention this. And this is yeah. in the units. One of the number one things that I love to do, if I can, put washer dryers in the units mm. that's uh, I, I can't imagine i can't believe i didn't mention that earlier but in my in my opinion if you look at a property and you're trying to take it from here to here a lot of times the difference is washer dryers right because a lot of people there's a different resident that will accept going to the common area laundry room to do the laundry once you get to a certain price point now you're getting in to a different group of people who say not happening. If I can't do my laundry in my apartment, even though I know 50 people use that machine before me in the past, they they want their own apartment. They want it to feel like it's theirs and they don't want to go to that common area. So I believe if I can add washer dryers to a unit, it raises that rent ceiling. It raises my ability to get better quality residents and higher rents. So yeah, I can't believe I forgot to mention that earlier. Sorry about that. No, no, I totally agree too. I've I've never lived in a place that didn't have a washer and dryer in it. <laughs> it sounds like a nightmare to go and wait around for this stuff or leave your stuff and try and time it to come back. I I don't know. It's, it's I just rather not do it. <laughs> right. Well, but having said that, there's a ton of properties out there that that's the way they operate, and that's okay. I'm not saying that's bad. No, I'm just saying you have to understand it because. You know, if you're trying to take rents from 1100 to 1900, there's a really good chance that that 1900 a month renter is going to want washer dryers, right? Definitely. You want to bake that into your analysis. So, no, these are these are great tips. I I love this. Um, before we were started here, you had like a, a program or a book or a, uh, not a book? Yeah, uh, your portfolio thing to mention. Yeah, yeah. So here's I, I wrote a book. It's called Multifamily Real Estate's a Total Game Changer. If you go to kripartners.com slash ebook, um, you can download it for free. It's no charge. I wrote it myself, but it focuses on two things. The first thing is everybody knows people are making a ton of money in real estate. They, they do. They, it's yeah. obvious. Everybody knows that. What people struggle with trying to figure out is how did it fit in their life? Remember, I told the story of how did real estate fit in my life? I was working at Deloitte, working 80 hours a week. Uh, that kind of drove me to a property that was big enough that I could hire everybody to do everything, right? So yeah. I help people in the first half of the book figure out how real estate can fit in their life. And what I find usually happens for most people, not all, but most people, they really should invest passively with experienced uh, sponsors because they still can make 15, 25, 35% plus annual returns and not have to do any of the work. So the second half of the book, here's the key, is teaching people how to vet sponsors. Because that's the second, that that's super important, right? If you're gonna passively invest with someone, how do you know who the right person is? And that becomes a really stressful experience for passive investors. And you know, I talk about, I'm really focused on experience. I think that's really important. Track record, that's really important transparency is super important. But then the second half of the book, I talk a lot about that. I even go into some, some of the things that make our, you know, companies like ours tick, like, why do we do the things that we do? Because I believe if you understand why certain people do things and why other people do certain things, it helps you figure out who the best match is for you as a potential passive investor. So it's kripartners.com slash ebook. It's a free download. You do get on our mailing list then. And if you want off, just unsubscribe. It's it's super easy to do. But uh, anyway, that's the book uh, that I hope is uh, very helpful for a lot of people trying to figure this business out. I think it would be too. Because um, a lot of people, what they do is they just rate shop. And you know the, the pro formas are just people making up the highest numbers that... <laughs> Which yeah. you know, it, it, you know what they are just numbers. There's pro forma numbers. So uh, yeah, it, it's there's more to it than picking the right person to work with. 
Um, so I think that, that's probably a good one. I'm probably going to sign up for it and read it myself just because I, I love to, I love to soak it up. Right. Um, sure. Ken, if people wanted to, to get a hold of you, your company, track you guys down, how do they do that? Yeah. So kripartners.com. Yep. That's the best way. Or you can shoot me an email, K G E E at kripartners.com. You'll remember, remember me by Kenny G, right? Most people, once <laughs> I say Kenny G, that's the exact response I always get. And then you'll remember my name forever. So K G E E at kripartners.com. And uh, then we can, you know, jump on a call if you want to understand what we do. That's fine. If you want to learn more about real estate, I'm happy to, you know, kind of put you in the right direction. So yeah, hopefully, uh, I hear from some of your listeners that I'd, I'd really enjoy that. I think you will. Thank you for coming on the show, Ken. I, uh, I appreciate it. There's lots of value in this and uh, uh, I'm going to have to come back and circle back and do this in another year. So I'll spread it out a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> I would love that. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.